Dobro veče, dobro došli na još jedan, verovatno i poslednji diskusijoni događaj u projektu Nezavereni u Beogradu i Los Angelesu, dekonstrukcija teorija zaveri lažnih vesti. Imat ćemo zadovoljstvo da čujemo izlaganje umetnice koja je poslednja u rezidenciji programu. Vidit ćemo posle za još neke aktivnosti. Preći ću na engleski jezik, ko hoće nešto da pita ili za neku reč ili tako može da u čat pošalje, meni, može i na sve, isto tako što se tiče pitanja. Tako da imat ćemo prilike da porazgovaramo i sa Bronvin i sa specijalnim gošćama večera s Anom Adamović i Milicom Pekić, koje sam zvao zbog srodnosti teme o kojoj ćemo slušati izlaganje i jednoj vrlo zanimljivoj projektnoj intervenciji na tu temu, na temu demokratije prošle godine. Okay, uh, good evening. Welcome to the last of the um, uh, presentation, or to say, events uh, within the project Unconspired in Belgrade and Los Angeles, uh, the construction of conspiracy theories and fake news. Um, we will have pleasure to hear the presentation of Bronwyn Moldin. Uh, um, she is a writer and uh, um, editor of um, specific publications uh, named zines uh, in uh, relating to related to her recent practice very much related to the topic of, of democracy and uh, she is our uh, uh, fourth uh, resident guest uh, that will help us to uh, discuss explore um, define, redefine, codifying the phenomenon of conspiracy theories, uh, also related to fake or so-called fake news, to all the set of problems that are related to um, a proliferation of uh, social media, um, topic that we covered in a previous uh, presentation uh, by Melissa Doll, who is uh, here with us, and uh, with presentation you can find of our uh, YouTube channel. Still not edited, uh, but there it is. Uh, so um, we will talk with uh, Bronwyn. Uh, she will present her work. It will be an artist talk. Uh, we will hear uh, um, uh, some uh, responses from uh, uh, Anna Adamovic and Milica Pekic, uh, who are invited as special guests because uh, uh, they did uh, a project very related to the topics of series of uh, Bronwyn's activities and uh, their project was uh, named uh, Performing Democracy. Uh, it is uh, um, available, uh, the link is on uh, our website and also on the website of uh, um, non-government cultural organization Kiosk, in which uh, Milica and Anna operate. So we will have, hopefully, uh, uh, both the uh, debate about uh, democracy, whatever it means or it meant, or we hope that it could or should mean, in United States or LA, California, or here in Belgrade, Serbia, or wider region of former Yugoslavia and Balkans, and also the capacity of uh, artistic practice uh, from documentation to intervention, from theorizing to hands-on day-to-day uh, -day struggle in social media space, in uh, art, art circles, in uh, cultural theory circles, and maybe contribute to more to say more insight to the structure of this phenomenon we are particularly interested in mechanisms of its occurrence generation and proliferation and uh, uh, also the struggle against many 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 very toxic very problematic uh, uh, consequences of uh, its um, uh, widespread and uh, widespread and popularity internationally unfortunately but also of, uh, uh, as uh, concerning the reactions that are not always uh, uh, totally correct and totally precise when it is about disqualifying disqualifying to say uh, discontent and uh, resistance Okay, uh, uh, Bronwyn, uh, she's a writer and uh, zine maker. Uh, she's also the creator of Democracy Series, a collection of handmade publications that explore the meaning and practice of democracy in contemporary American life. 
in Maldives talk tonight, she will trace uh, her artistic engagement, engagement with democracy from the first novel, Love Songs of the Revolution. We have a copy if you have interest. The creation of her uh, uh, Zine series, to her work, uh, uh, all then to her work with activist group Artists for Democracy against, and the launch of the Institute for Conspiracy Theory, something that we are especially interested in now. Uh, uh, Institute for Conspiracy, Conspiracy Theory Analysis with uh, uh, Dr. Melissa Wall. We will also uh, uh, have opportunity to see some, um, some of the um, uh, social practice art interventions currently being developed, uh, developed in ICTA, okay? Okay, Brandon, thank you very much for visiting us, for being so courageous to travel from LA <laughs> to Belgrade, not that, uh, uh, Tra travel friendly times and um, uh, uh, yes now i will uh, hand over with my great pleasure and somebody that is just a, a superficial uh, um, uh, to say uh, connoisseur or a friend of uh, co contemporary literary scene i will uh, hand over the moderation of this discussion to nadja bobicic um, our collaborator for some time in cultural center x uh, uh, a literary uh, theoretician and activist in um, um, in a group uh, Rebel Readers, published uh, in That is uh, uh, fortunately and to our great pleasure engaged in very up to date, very um, very ambitious and very emancipatory oriented uh, literary critique that fights with both. Uh, uh, conservatism, let's say, in style, in um, uh, gender and sex distribution of literary, <laughs> literary awards, <laughs> and um, and in the end gives us opportunity to uh, to be at, at least updated with that what is going on in uh, in literary circle, circles here. After we entered something that somebody some people call democracy. Okay, Nadja, please take it over if, if you have to add something and uh, thank you for uh, uh, accepting uh, um, uh, our call. Thanks, thank you, thank to Anna and, and to, to Milica. I'm happy to participate as an audience. There are two of us, three maybe in the audience, all, all engaged in the project. And uh, I think that um, uh, it is good atmosphere to conspire against uh, against conspiracy conspiracy theories. So we will be accused anyway. Today, just a small. So today there was you can imagine after I don't know how many years of time there is discussion in cultural centers about conspiracy theories. In the same day, in Institute for Philosophy Social Theory today, there was the first lecture about conspiracy theories. So, and somebody will say that we are not conspired. I mean, it's no way <laughs> we have to, we have to, you know, cope with this, uh, 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 you know, uh, incidental or, um, or uh, you know, like uh, intentional maybe coincidences. Okay, Nadja, please, floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Nabisha. Thank you all for coming. <laughs> and um, uh, I believe that we will have a great uh, debate tonight. Uh, also, thank you very much, Bromin, for coming to Belgrade and for your willingness to talk with us and to debate with us. And um, as we planned yesterday, now is the time for your presentations, after, a presentation after which we um, could start Q&A session and talk about different perspectives uh, and different um, fields in which you are active. You're active in democracy, you're active in critical analysis, you're active uh, in arts, arts field. So um, let's start this talk. The floor is yours. Ah, thank you so much, Nadia. Let's see. All right, everyone. I thank you so much. Uh, this has been such a fabulous trip to Belgrade and, and so happy to be here and be part of part of this. And Looking forward to our conversation uh, as we go through this. So let me talk a little bit about uh, kind of my path through um, through democracy, through literature, through zine making. Um, first off, I should mention I'm the author of a couple of couple of books. Uh, Love Songs of the Revolution was actually set in Lithuania in 1989 as the Berlin Wall was falling. 
Uh, the Streetwise Cycle is a cycle of stories uh, about a homeless man living on the streets of Los Angeles. Um, issues of social social justice have always been important to me as a writer and um, I, other things I'm very interested in. I, I love the natural world as a writer. I've been a uh, an artist in residence at Mesa Verde National Park in Colorado. This is um, a place that's known for um, old uh, ancient Puebloan dwellings uh, that were carved into the rock face and around the 1100s. Um, and uh, I've also been an artist in resident at, at Denali National Park in uh, the largest state of Alaska. That is not a photo of me, by the way, at Denali. Um, so one of the things that happened, uh, so I was, I was in uh, Mesa Verde in 2016. I was in uh, Denali in 2018. Um, and one of the things that happened at the end of 2016, I think uh, most of us know, is that we had a, a very, very problematic election in the United States and a very terrible human being was uh, was elected to be president. And it was quite evident, like the mo like the night of the election, the, the very next day, uh, you know, I, I was out on the streets and many people I knew were out in the streets already beginning to protest at that very moment. Um, and as I started to talk to friends and, uh, and colleagues, people who I knew really cared deeply about, uh, about social justice, about democracy, about what was happening or about to happen to our country. And I would say, well, you know, we're going to be in the streets, right? I mean, that's what the next thing we have to do. We have to speak out and we have to, to be loud and we have to. And so I was surprised at how many people that I knew were people of goodwill who kind of stepped back a little bit when I started talking about protests and said, well, is it safe to go to a protest? Is it, is it safe to take my kid? Is it safe? And I, I was stunned. I realized that so many people that I knew, that I knew cared about what was happening to our country had never been to a protest before. And I was like, what were you doing during the Bush years? But that's a, maybe another conversation. So um, I, I, I contacted a local organization that does free classes. And I kind of, you know, they, they do classes in exchange for, you know, give me some beans and rice and I'll teach a class on something I'm an expert in. And I said, would you be interested in a class on protest 101? And they said, yes, absolutely. So I designed the class, and as I designed the class, I designed a handbook to go with it, a zine. And um, so this was the so, so this is the cover of the very first zine that I made, Protest 101. Um, and they, there were a number of things going on. It wasn't just that I, I that um, I wanted to teach a class, and I wanted to get people comfortable with um, with protesting. Um, but I also, I was having a very severe reaction to what had happened to, so, to me on social media and kind of observing the time I had spent on Facebook during 2016 and how incredibly unhealthy it had been. I was like, I want to be doing works that have a physical presence. I want to do stuff on paper and I want to be in rooms with other people and let's talk about what's happening. And this was... So this was a pretty profound moment for me. So I created the zine to, 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 and I taught the classes several times and would hand out the zine at all the classes. And we would, we would discuss it and kind of use it as a guide to, to, to talking about what is a protest. And, um, you know, we had um, close to a million people in the streets in Los Angeles, I think. We had a million people in the streets in Washington, DC. I like to, to imagine that at least a handful of them were there because they came to my class. Um, so, uh, so I was totally hooked by that experience. So I started creating more zines. The next one I wrote was about voter suppression, which is a serious problem in the United States and continues to be and how, um, helping people to understand. I think that it's much better understood today in 2021 than it was in 2016. I did uh, a zine all about how to go to a local meeting of your local government and give public testimony, make public, uh, to, uh, to give a public comment. Um, I did one on voting, um, I, you know, why we vote, um, because voting, it's actually kind of important. Um, this is uh, a, a spread from, from the zine um, where it talks about, you know, how, how, how not to choose who to vote for, some, some guidance for, 
Uh, one of the problems is that we, when we go to the to, to the to to the ballot box, we see the list of names, and no one is anyone that we really support a hundred percent. So what are we supposed to do? And so my advice is pick the least worst of the options. So then um, I uh, was in Denali and started working on zines around the uh, the relationship, you know, what I saw about the impact of climate change that's happening, right? You can see it right there in the in the park, um, kind of the, the relationship between democracy and climate and what's happening to our planet and and our ability as 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 citizens as human beings to 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 determine what's going on um, in you know what these giant corporations are doing to to the planet what's uh, what's happening to the planet is connected to our ability to speak out for ourselves and to demand from our governments uh, the things that we want um, and I went a little deeper on a zine that went with that about democratizing your commute. And one of the things I, I began exploring that I think um, I'm, I'm continuing to work with as a concept is the idea of the automobile as basically a form of tyranny. Um, it is the automobile that, you know, we, we thought it was going to give us all this freedom and instead we are enslaved by the automobile, but we're also enslaved by the, uh, the the energy systems, you know, what it takes to get the oil out of the ground and how that damages democracy in the countries where the oil is coming from, how, you know, how the, the damage that uh, that oil, the burning of oil, coal is doing to our um, to our environment. And these uh, I think there's a very strong relationship between automobiles and our lack of democracy. Um, I started working on a new zine that I, I haven't finished yet, but I'll give you some sneak previews. And it's a zine all about that basically bicycles are the solution to all bad forms of government. Um, and it turns out there are many different types of bad forms of government and many words for it. And I, I'm interested in exploring whether I love to ride my bicycle, even in Los Angeles, I love to ride my bicycle. So I'm exploring whether uh, other bicycles might be part of the solution to the problem. And that gets me to, um, I want to talk a little bit about an activist group that I'm part of that also formed um, after, in, in the wake of the election of Trump in 2016. Um, I got involved with them a few couple of years later, and that's a group called Artists for Democracy. And we are a group of people who um, are concerned about democracy and are specifically and especially focused on um, getting artists and art students to engage with democracy. Um, and it's it, it, one of the interesting that's, things that happened. So in, um, in 2020, during the, in the lead up to the 2020 election, we focused, we organized artist talks, we supported get out the vote uh, efforts, we supported organizations that were doing get out the vote work um, to basically get out the vote and help and to specifically to get artists and art students to register and vote, register and vote. We've got to register and vote, um, which I think is really interesting when you think of like radical artists and what we're trying to do is get people to just show up at the polls, the basic, just the basics getting engaged. Um, I think that uh, our, our position is that Elections aren't the end of democracy. They aren't all of democracy. They are just the starting point to democracy. And we've got to pe get people in. Uh, the, you know, it, it's it, it's that gateway drug to democracy. If we can get folks to to engage in elections, do the basics of engaging in elections. I think folks may know that turnout in elections in the United States is terrible. Um, in presidential years, it's it's it, it's pretty good. In 2020, we had the highest turnout in many years. But local elections, those, those in between in the four years when all the elections that happen in between presidential elections, we can get turnout of 30% sometimes for local elections. And we're telling artists and art students that your vote matters, that, uh, that you need to get engaged. Um, and so I did create a couple of zines for Artists for Democracy. One of them is um, called artists for democracy and it's a series of portraits of well-known artists and things that they have said about democracy and how important it is for artists to be engaged or for them as artists to be engaged. Um, in the run-up to the 2020 election, I, I did a zine 
that was that's like a how to guide on how to get ready to vote just the basics a lot of people um we've discovered uh they just they're not paying attention they don't realize there's an election coming they don't think about well if i'm going to have to stand in line um you know how many hours might i have to stand in line do i need to find child care while i'm waiting i'm standing in line to vote um you know you know do i need to what do i need to plan my day because uh, because and also in the united states you are not automatically registered to vote um, you have to register to vote and then you have to vote and that can be very confusing for people they don't realize that there's this additional step so making sure they're registered uh, some states make it very hard to register and you have to register at least two weeks in advance so it re requires planning ahead so we did the zine all about that to help people figure out how to vote uh, one of the, our collective members um, is from Mexico so she was able to, to translate it into Spanish and so we were able to publish in both English and Spanish, and that was uh, really important for us. So that brings me to here and why I'm here in Belgrade and why Unconspired and this project is inspiring to me as an artist and why I think it matters to democracy. And I'm gonna walk you through an example of a conspiracy theory that is right now having a negative impact on American democracy right now and that is this very very popular thing i'm sure you've heard it this was the theme on january 2nd when the folks stormed the stormed the capitol was stop the steal the 2020 election was stolen from donald trump that is the conspiracy theory there is this is not true there is no evidence all of the audits show that the election was fair and square however this can and, and it's about 29 uh, public opinion polls show that about 29 percent of americans believe that this is true that the 2020 election was stolen a little less than a third of americans however within the republican party trump's party very very large numbers of people believe this to be true that's two-thirds of of trump's party pretty much agree that the election was stolen only 18 percent members of his party disagree that that conspiracy theory is not true. Well, does it matter what they believe? Does it matter? I mean, it mattered on, December, on January 6th when folks showed up at the Capitol, but it also matters right now. This has turned and in, translated into tremendous negative impact on voters. The statement that everything possible should be done to make it easy for every citizen to vote the percent of Republicans who believe that every that we should make it easy for every citizen to vote has declined dramatically. This belief that the election is stol was stolen is translating into people believing that we should make it harder for Americans to vote. And this, this is so problematic. And what, what we're seeing in states across the country, especially those that are dominated by the Republican Party, is that they are passing laws that are making it harder for people to vote. They are making it harder for people to vote. They are, you know, er making early vote, cutting down on early voting, making it, in, making it harder for you to vote by mail, making it harder for you to fill in the forms. They are throwing people off the rolls if they haven't shown up for elections in a few years. They are doing all sorts of things to make it harder for people to vote. And in many states, they are doing this and they are specifically targeting African Americans, Latinos, other people of color, indigenous people, all of these folks, this is translating into a real crisis for democracy. If voting is like just the basic, it is the introduction, it is the, if people do not feel that their voice is heard at the ballot box, how can they feel that they, their voice is going to be heard when they get out into the streets? So this is a problem. This is a conspiracy theory that is damaging our democracy right now. But that's why I care about this so very much. And let's be very clear, this is a spread from my zine about uh, voter suppression. It is known, it is statistically known that the lower percent of people who show up to vote, conservatives, Republicans are more likely to win. When people don't show up to vote, so voter suppression is good for the Republican party. So this, this statement that this this idea that oh they want to they want to make it harder for people to vote is not based on some 
ideological argument or some moral argument. It is because this is power. This is them exercising their power so that they will win elections. This is deeply problematic. So there was a piece, um, the voice that you shared with me about uh, conspiracy and kind of looking back at the roots of the word con, the, the, the Latin roots together, respire, breathing together. What folks are breathing together, what they are whispering to each other, what they are plotting, this has a real impact on human beings and it's having a real impact in the United States. I was interested, but we, our, but we have some serious challenges here, right, to figure out how we tackle this. And I'm thinking about uh, Jack Bradish's talk, the first talk for this series, where he talked about the importance of skepticism. Skepticism is so important to democracy. We don't want a bunch of people sitting around, like just take, taking what the powers that be say for granted and just believing them. We want people to be skeptical. We want them to ask questions. And a lot of these conspiracy theorists, that's exactly what they're doing. They're being skeptical of power. They're asking questions. Um, Richard, Richard Wolf talked about alternatives, that we need to offer alternatives to the narratives that are so problematic. That's what these conspiracy theorists say. They're offering alternatives. How do we judge their alternatives versus our alternatives? I think this is a real challenge for us to tackle conspiracy theories and what they're doing. And I want to reference Melissa Wall's talk as well, where she talked about how the, the evolution of uh, online participation has taken us from being a, an active citizen in the indie media days to be a, a consumer of a product, uh, blogging software, social media software, to being entrepreneurs. We're, we are being trained to be in a constant state of selling. We're constantly selling. And she drew the line very clearly between conspiracy theories and propaganda. And if we think of this, this thing that, that's happening right now is that we have all these folks who are engaging online in, in this what looks like entrepreneurial activity, but is simply sharing propaganda. It's promoting propaganda. It's promoting these strange alternatives and this strange skepticism that is leading people to do things like say, we should make it harder for Americans to vote. This is the problem we're facing. I, I wish I was here to offer you the solution, but I think that the, all of the conversations we've had and the talks and the folks we've heard from um, have, have talked about all of these issues. So that leads me to the project. In our effort, uh, Melissa Wall and I are, have, have, have launched a, a project that we hope will begin to, that we're beginning to explore some possible solutions. And we're calling it the Institute for Conspiracy Theory Analysis. Um, it is, uh, as she said in her talk, uh, it is directly influenced by the Institute for Propaganda Analysis, our website, icta.space. You can come and visit it. And we, there's a, a fair amount of material on there, and it, it's, you know, it's still in early days. We're still developing it. But one of the things we're specifically developing is interventions, activities, uh, engagements that people can do to try and to, to see how we can intervene in these conspiracy theories that are doing damage. Um, first thing we've done is we've published a zine. You may be surprised. Um, and uh, the zine uh, is called Connect the Dots. Connect the Dots. This is something that the conspiracy theory theorists love to talk about. We're connecting the dots. And um, so this is a Connect the Dots puzzle, if you'll remember Connect the Dots. And what you see on the left and the right here is uh, it's, it's, it's the same dots and, if, and they've, they've been connected in one direction. And if you connect the dots with your pen in one direction, you'll see one thing. If on the right, you see the same dots, but if you choose, pick and choose which dots you like, you rearrange them in an order that tells a better story that you wanna tell, and maybe you ignore the dots that you don't really like, you may see something very different. So that's our connect the dots zine. We've also created a conspiracy theory bingo game. I don't know, is bingo a thing people do here in Serbia? So this is, uh, these are, this is a whole page of conspiracy theories, I, theories. And I'd say, walk around your life and mark them off as you encounter each one. And whoever is the first to get five across, five down, or five on the diagonal wins the game. Maybe you should mark the ones that you actually believe in as you go through on your conspiracy theory bingo game. 
And we have um, a classroom exercise that Melissa designed um, on how to, this one is designed around debunking the salad dressing conspiracy theory specifically, although I think this, this exercise could work for many conspiracy theories, and that is testing whether um, taking a conspiracy theory and digging in deep to find out what are the, 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 the factual roots. I mean, every conspiracy theory, there are some actual true facts hidden in there. Is it more effective to go uh, to, to, to fact check it or is it more effective to make fun of it? And this exercise can walk through students through the, through the process of doing that. Um, so, so you can go to our website, icta.space, check out these interventions, a few more, and we'll, we'll continue to be developing them. And then thinking to the future, I think a couple of things that um, we're, we're looking at, I, you know, we, we, we talk about plotting and the conspiracy theories and plots of, that are being designed in, in conspiracy theories is we're going to be working on stories as well and looking at different forms of narratives that we can, where we can explore um, the narratives that will that can translate into good things happening for people rather than narratives that we're seeing that are translating into bad things like voter suppression what are the what are the narratives that we can that how can we break the the bad narratives but also offer alternative new narratives that bring people together that give people hope for the future that help people to want to engage, to believe that engaging in voting, in protests, in speaking up to their government, that they can't, their voice matters. And those are the stories that we want to be able to tell as well. There's our website. There's my website. And that is the end of my talk. So let's have a conversation. Yeah. Thank you very much for your talk. It was very interesting and engaging in so many different levels. Um, from my perspective, two uh, aspects were very important and I think that we could start a discussion from them. The one is um, what you're talking about, um, um, suspensions of votes, uh, rights to vote, because it's uh, like basic, uh, basic democracy, but um, it is just suspended in so many different ways. So we have that fight to, to be fighting. We don't, I think, we don't have uh, exactly the same uh, problem, but we also have the problem with uh, what could be democracy, what is the practicing of democracy, are we all equal in, um, and at the end is uh, that ballot or um, like checking some names, is it democracy, democracy at the end of the road? Uh, so you, you, you get what I'm talking about. And the other one is those uh, artistic interventions, because um, I think just similar like you, uh, if you are trying rationally to explain, maybe now we have a problem with vaccinations and so-called anti-vax uh, theories. Uh, if people are um, um, don't believe in our health system care anymore, if they are um, afraid uh, because it's a global pandemic. They, of course, they are afraid. How could we talk with those people? Maybe sometimes just rational explanations aren't enough. So, what is the um, the power of art of engage art to transcend some ideas? So that would be like just just a little bit uh, of uh, just small questions for the start. Um, we will give uh, all the people in the public the possibility to talk with you. So maybe if you would like to answer me now, and then uh, we, I would like something to ask Anna and Melissa also. Okay. All right. If I had the answer, I wish. Um, you know, I think there are artists. Artists have the ability to come at things from those unexpected angles. Um, to to use to use images, to use sound, to use words, to use, uh, you know, use the human body to engage people. And um, I think that, that if we can break into the narratives in unexpected places, you know, I think that there, there's, there's a decent amount of evidence that fact-checking conspiracy theories is not effective um, for helping people to understand the truth. So I think that those, those interventions that can engage people at an emotional level, you know, I, I, 
I, I understand that people, one of the reasons people don't want to get vaccines is because they're afraid. So let's address their fears. Let's talk about their fears, but let's also engage other emotions. You know, what are they hopeful for? And if we as artists can begin to, uh, to, to offer those, those, build on their, 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 their better wishes for the future rather than the fears that have them pulling back, um, I think that, that that's, that's going to be a great start. And I honestly believe in the power of humor um, very much to, uh, to, to help people bring people's defenses down. I think that um, there are so many forces in the world that are pushing us apart that I want to figure out what are the forces that can pull us together in a way that's that's positive. And I really do believe that humor can be something that that can do that. Humor, surprise, the unexpected. And about the, the form of zines, you 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 are making zines. Uh, uh, how is the, the people? How are people? People reacting, you know. Now we are just online. Of course, those things are uh, we can we can um, see them in online space. But um, that is some kind of form uh, which that that kind of form started to develop itself in like a um, hundred years ago. Uh, these were uh, all very uh, in in our um, context they were popular. But now they are uh, again popular and engaging. So maybe would you tell us? What, what are the reactions on, on the zines you are working on? The history of zines is super interesting. And in the United States, uh, the, the kind of advent of where zines got to be really, really, really kind of big culturally was actually as photocopiers became, were introduced and became widespread. And uh, that, that happened in kind of, I'm going to say the, the late 80s. And so it, it was often uh, connected with punk rock culture. And people making zines about, you know, doing their, you know, they type up, draw, whatever, and put it on a photocopier, fold it, staple it, and hand it out to their friends. And this became a very, very popular form of communication. And, and, and people could talk about things that they didn't see in mainstream magazines or in mainstream news. And when blogs and social media came along, zines kind of declined in their popularity because everybody could tell their story on a blog now. And um, I think many people have been through what I've been through, which is kind of being like uh, beaten to death by by social media and have returned to uh, to zines. Zine festivals uh, before 2000 were getting bigger and bigger and you'd come to festivals and people would table and swap zines and sell zines. Um, my zines are available in uh, bookstores across the US uh, and they're in libraries. And uh, there, there's even, uh, I have a set of them in a time capsule that I think is maybe going to be opened in a hundred years. And my fear is that people are going to open it up in a hundred years and go, oh, remember democracy? That was cool. I think grandma used to talk about that. But I hope that doesn't happen. Um, uh, but I, I had an interesting thing happen to me just a couple of weeks ago. I was contacted by an instructor who teaches at a school for the arts uh, in North Carolina asking me, could I, could he buy a big pile of my zines because the school is starting a program that is about uh, civic engagement specifically for art students, high school art students, and they wanted to use the zines as, uh, as a teaching tool. I think that this says a lot about uh, the fact that an art school is doing this with high school students. I think that gives me a lot of hope. Um, and that they wanted to use an art object as the teaching tool, I think was really exciting as well. Yeah, that's very interesting. And maybe sometimes people, sometimes people uh, want to, to touch, like when, when they have it in their hands and they can do whatever they want, they can make some kind of interventions that, that could be uh, connected in a way with, um, with okay, we have uh, social media, we can interact in different ways, but people just love paper sometimes i don't know how to explain it but it's materialized in a way so i think uh, that that's very great that that um, your zines are, are going to be used as a tool for learning okay uh now thank you uh i wanted to ask um anna and milica maybe to make a comparison with uh, with what you were talking about democracy about the challenges of democracy in the united states um anna and uh, milica are doing this very interesting project from, of course, our context, or maybe 
uh, they to tell us about um, what, what, what is what you have learned from your series. What is democracy now in Serbia? How is it perceived? What are different kinds of democracy? Uh, what are different kinds of associations when you say democracy? What were the answers of different people you were talking about in your series that you that they give to you? Uh, and what are the main obstacles and challenges to coming to that space? What democracy could be? That's my question. It's better you, said. You are more optimistic. Yeah. <laughs> well, okay. It's it's kind of. I'll give. I'll give just a quick. Uh, respond to your question because we we collected twenty seven. Uh, we collect. We created. 27 videos of variety of different groups and and parties and unions and uh, citizens that are connected around some particular fight or issue that is um, that is challenging them so they got together and organized to kind of confront this issue or problem or challenge and um, so there all the statements are available online uh, what was my impression doing it? We, we we took some sort of let's say neutral position. Although when you select whom you're going to interview, you always there is some kind of uh, uh, um, intervention behind that. The different people would select probably different uh, interviewees. So we can't say that we were totally neutral, but we were trying to suppress. Uh, whatever we believe, even me and Anchi, uh, me and Anna, we work together for almost 20 years and we are very different in how do we, uh, in what do we think about democracy and we have different opinions and this is, I think, very fruitful for our collaboration and, um, and for our, our joint work. So what was for me, I wouldn't go into the kind of uh, uh, defining what people said, but what was for me the biggest impression is that this question matters it matters to people it's not we all we usually believe that people are ambivalent that the question of politics and democracy and whatever they are not interested in but actually when you go and speak with people they're very passionate about it they care it's important to them from wherever specter spectrum ideological spectrum they come the issue of democracy they link to their personal experience of life, what do they uh, experience in their life as a challenge, how the life looks like, how the society looks like, how the environment looks like, and they speak uh, um, very passionately about them. Most of them uh, uh, do not recognize uh, the system we live in as democratic, so they were giving a variety of different uh, uh, paths and perspectives what for them would democracy mean or what certain system has to fulfill in order to be called democratic i would just this is re my reflection on on the project uh, uh, direct answer try, my attempt to answer your question i don't know but i would also like just to reflect a little bit on what uh, bronwyn was saying um, it's interesting this experience, and I did look both the uh, presentations of Jack and Richard Wolf, uh, all coming from the US context. It's very interesting how the, what the conspiracy theories mean and so on. It's a very, um, I would just ask the question, do we know what democratic instruments are? Elections are, is democratic instrument, one of it. But if we look, for example, the experience of Brexit, you can say the referendum, and I'm referring to that because it's very kind of, a, um, I think at this particular moment uh, in, for Serbia, it's very interesting situation because just parliament adopted the changes on the law of referendum and public initiative, which we should consider as a democratic instruments of people's participation in governance. But uh, so if we learn from the experience of UK Brexit, so you see how those instruments are being more and more corrupt. From whichever side you look, Democratic, Republican, Conservative, left wing, this wing, this, that position, but you see the very instruments of democracy are being more and more corrupt. In UK, 
it's proven on court that the people running the campaign for Brexit were direct, using direct lies. They were lying to people. And based on those lies, they won the referendum. And the UK majority of people in the UK voted for the UK to leave the European Union, the consequences of which we are seeing today. So the people were manipulated within the legitimate democratic instrument of people participation in decision making. So I would say, and today, so what the Serbian government did, they've changed the law, so they um, abolished the census for referendum. Any, so who, the, uh, um, there is no limit of how many, or the census of how many people is needed to go to vote on referendum issues. So the majority of those who voted will decide on the certain question on the referendum. And that also enables, from one side, you can think, OK, that motivates people to, uh, to participate. It makes it easier because collecting this number of votes or the percentage of people who needs to go. So it, it can be a useful tool for people to vote. But when you know that all the instruments of propaganda, as you say, media, they are all privately owned, most of them, and of course, you have some state owned but they're manipulated by the dominant party and so what are the instruments of sharing the information and who shares which information there we come to the conspiracy theories but now i think i speak too much but it's kind of that could be actually the tool for the government to say ah we are opening our democracy we are enabling we're improving our democratic tools but actually what they're doing is making them uh, uh, making new paths for them to e more easily bring some decisions that they want to manipulate people and already we know elections uh, in Serbia we had the, on the previous elections there was a huge boycott campaign of most of the opposition parties who didn't want to go to the elections due to the the, uh, uh, the, the fact that they don't have the same ambient for campaign they don't have approach to the media and so on it's the same question today so i would also think that we should think about those the de demo existing democratic instruments which are corrupt and and then in this situation how do we speak about democracy sorry that was too long <laughs> so do you want to, do you want me to continue or you want to Maybe, um, well, if you want to make some kind of uh, uh, to, to, to add <laughs> into uh, those questions, of course, you can or maybe Roman could answer and then we could speak with you. It's really up to you if you want to continue Bonjour. this way. Bonjour. Okay. I'll say just a few things because you, you brought up some really important issues and I think the referendum issue is is such an enormous one. Um, in California, we have a we have uh, because of our, our, our very progressive history, um, California is one state in the United States that has a lot of uh, referenda and citizen initiatives. And that system has been corrupted by money. Um, I think it's not, not been, it was not always possible to pay, you, you had to collect signatures and get enough signatures to get the referendum on the ballot. And now people are paid to collect signatures to get things on the ballot. So it's so if you have enough money, it's really quite easy to get a referendum um, on the ballot in California. And we just went through a recall election. Um, I, I won't go into the details, but uh, the, there was an attempt to recall our, the, the governor of California. And um, the huge amounts of money were poured in to, to support the recall election. Um, and we had a, 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 some, a, we saw something in California that we also see nationally, which is that rural areas, uh, more conservative areas, they were able to get enough signatures to get it on the ballot. But where the actual people live, it, the, the, the recall election failed by like, huge percentages. And that, that rural urban split has become very significant in the United States. But what happened is because it, it was fairly easy to get the referendum on the ballot, because in the past, we, it, we, there was a very progressive governor back in the 1930s, I want to say, who, who created that law because they wanted to be able to get corrupt politicians out of office and they wanted to give the citizens the power to do that. Fast forward to today, and it doesn't take that much money to get a bill, a 
a referendum on the ballot. And so enormous amounts of money were wasted on a recall election that lost very, very badly. But groups like ours, Artists for Democracy, we geared up, we started doing communications, we spent a ton of time and energy. And it's, it's um, I, the way I like to see this as using the tools of democracy to try and undermine democracy is what they're doing. The governor was up for reelection in a year and they tried to recall him. So there's a way to get rid of a governor you don't like you and that's the next election but rather than waiting till the next election because they knew they would lose the election they put a ton of money they put this recall and wasted hundreds of millions of taxpayer dollars on an election so i i think that the question of how do we prevent referend how do we make a referendum be the thing it's supposed to be which is to give us as citizens power to, to prevent it from being manipulated by those with money. Okay. So, um, maybe yeah, you I, want I, to... Oh. Um, I, I just wanted to say, this is why I wanted Melissa to talk about our projects first, because she's really much, much more optimistic, um, not about what we did, but about um, the responses and what we heard. And I, I really do share um, her excitement about what we got in the project and how people reacted and how they really cared and how passionate they are about democracy and i'm sure that you are facing the the same thing when you are talking uh, with uh, with your friends or people you work with or you want to approach um however i'm a bit i'm a bit afraid and especially now when when i was listening to you Bronwyn, and when i was thinking about our project in 2021 now that when we are you know um, when our elections are getting closer how um how uh, kind of everyone we spoke with uh, in the project are very passionate about the politics and are very passionate about democracy but um you have impression that actually on the day of the elections they won't go to the elections because they don't believe in the system anymore because they think that everyone is the same because they think that their vote actually doesn't matter and that we have to find another ways um to fight for our rights and then also when you go because we were now talking about referendums when you go and um, for example uh, when you're invited to sign the petition for which whichever thing um and you know sometimes i'm really like joking that my morning starts with me signing a petition and then i go to do other things um and i'm always surprised you know it's easy it's very easy to sign the petition especially now because it, they are online uh so you don't have to go somewhere and do something um and i'm always surprised you know everyone is super passionate about everything and we know the system is corrupted and we know things are not working and we know we have to change something uh because we have children because we have yeah you know what whatever reason there is but even those petitions are not signed so you know you just need to click you know i sign you don't even have to put your own name there yeah i mean so this is this is what what is kind of confusing in a way and then i was you know i was really like in serbia you don't have to teach people to do protests because you know this is this is what we we have a really long tradition uh with as maybe especially our generation uh during the 90s and stuff but you know i can understand that because a few nights ago there was a, this protest I mean, I would love to say big protest, but it was actually a very small protest about huge issue, the, the thing on the wall, which they like to call mural, but it is art form, but it is a, like a thing on the wall with the uh, uh, war criminal, Ratko Mladic. And, you know, I was thinking, you know, like, yeah, I should go, but I live, you know, in another part of the city and it's already started. And when I come there, it will be finished. And, you know, who is going to be with my son. So, so this is when we are losing, you know, we are losing that fight. And so this is my concern in a way with, our, with, the, with what we heard from our correspondents and what I'm hearing from you as well, because now we have to teach other people to react and we need to teach ourselves to react. 
and at the elections day, no one goes. So, you know, it's, it's, I think it's very, um, yeah, it's, it's very pessimistic in a way, I would say. Well, maybe I would like to um, ask all of you, and uh, not uh, that question, uh, do we have democracy or not? Are we optimistic or pessimistic? but maybe just for tonight to try to create in from some creative space think in which ways we can make a state and for example that, that's uh, uh, that's what was going in belgrade for days now when um Yelena and Ada, uh, make a statement on some wall <laughs> they, they just put some eggs on the wall and uh, really a lot of people just started talking about okay we are going um to different parts of the city, we are seeing all those so-called murals, and we are not liking them. We don't want fascism. You know what they were talking uh, like two or three days on, on the, some televisions with uh, with a lot of viewers. What Ada was so talking about, it's enough of fascism. What Yelena was talking like, people come here, what are you doing? Why aren't you reacting? For me, that was inspiring. And they also called us to think about different kinds of um, uh, of um, uh, rebellion, like they, they, they sort of finish the thing. So I think sometimes um, when we are talking, is it okay or not? Are we pessimistic or not? Maybe it's some kind of, um, it's pessimistic per se. I would like to, to ask you some practices, just to think like um, uh, Bronwyn is doing her zines, what could we do? from artist's perspective, from journalist's perspective, from whatever kind of perspective you can um, first make an association. That would be maybe something we could talk now. What is that makes you think about, uh, I'm going to do it. Not all the things that we aren't doing it, but what, what, what's inspiring for us now in this, tonight maybe in Belgrade, in, I don't know, I'm in Tirana now, but in LA, um, Nebuisha, maybe you have some suggestions, whoever wants uh, on Zoom or uh, in reality to give some examples, you're welcome also, uh, Anna, Milica, Bromin. Um. Again, I'm jumping in, but I'm quite, I see examples everywhere, I must say. Uh, the things are changing quickly. The topics we are discussing, we didn't discuss environment in such a scale like 10, 15 years ago. So I'm, I'm, although it looks, I think the system is crashing, the dominant capitalism, let's talk about capitalism. But let's try not to give diagnosis as you said, because most of us are facing that on daily life. So we see that the system is crashing. But what I see more and more, I see little alternatives. I see us talking here now about, I see colleagues from US talking about the same topics, facing the same similar. It used to be very different, the circumstances in US and Serbia, capitalism, socialism, or transitional something. And we didn't understand much why you have to pay for health in school. We didn't have to, but now we understand each other. We see, and we are faced with very similar issues. And I think, I see on various different levels, even in art production, I see a big change in art production. And I think it's a change of values. It takes time because it has, the system has to change. In art, it's, was, it's still dominant system is based on this great figure of artist, the big author and artwork, which then goes on the market in circulation. It's very hard to break that logic because it has its own strong support and base but i see more and more artists going into totally different logic creating doing workshops process-based things something that you cannot circulate on the market and okay pro the project was something to be kind of at certain point was kind of framing this type of art practice but that's not good enough it's already visible already it's visible that the project logic is not responsible responding well actually is not adequate for this what this art practice is so i can say from my example i'm for example magazine cultural center in belgrade which is self-governed doesn't have any employees no management no curation it's uh, it's run and governed by the people who are using the space it works everybody would say it's, it's impossible it cannot work it works and it's getting more and more users and the program is is uh, developing so 
I see those, I'm, that's why I'm optimistic. I see new topics, I see new solutions. It will take time. We were never taught, even in socialist Yugoslavia, we were not taught to work together as collective. We were in educated in the primary schools, see, like individuals, competitive. Who's going to go back? Who's going to get better mark, better results in school? So I think to change the whole logic of the system takes time, but I think it's happening, and that's why I'm op optimist. Optimist. <laughs> um, I, I, I'll throw something out there as 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 action, and this is going to sound so small and so unimportant, um, and, but and. And a little bit I'm joking, but a little bit I'm completely serious is in Los Angeles, riding my bicycle, riding my bicycle to work, I feel like is an act of, of uh, it, it makes me feel like I am the boss of my own, my own body, my own time. I makes me feel like I have to, I have, well, before, before the pandemic, I had to go, go to drive to a day job every day or take the bus, but getting on my bicycle was a moment where I felt like I wasn't trapped by my job um it was also i could feel like i was um that i was i was breaking out of the capitalist system the system that uh, the the gasoline production the the automobile being trapped in the automobile it just it felt and i kept trying to get other people to ride their bikes getting people to ride a bicycle in los angeles is not easy let me tell you but it's actually not that hard to ride a bicycle in Los Angeles. You've, you've, you've ridden all over LA, so maybe you have some comments on that. But I think that we, uh, that, you know, the, these, these small acts of, of uh, riding a bicycle doesn't seem like an act of rebellion, but it does in Los Angeles. So what are, wherever we are, what is the small act of rebellion that we can do that we can encourage other people to do and join with us and eventually kind of build build out from that center. Um, I, I, and I believe that those actions are related to a sense of self determination. And if we can help people to build their feeling of self determination, then maybe they'll show up to vote but maybe they'll do the more important things that democracy demands of us i think there is also one thing that maybe it's like so obvious but we are kind of forgetting it how important it is um uh, the the kiosk practice is very simple for almost 20 years Milica and me realized that one day when we were traveling around serbia doing the democracy project that what we do actually we go to uh, different people and they're really nice to let us in their homes and we ask them different questions i mean whatever we are interested in in that moment and they're really kind and um, so uh, everything we do is actually like every single thing we did uh was done because we met these people and they were kind to us and that is also something which reflects in my own practice, artistic practice, I would say in Milita's own practice. And I think it's um, sometimes we forget, but I think it's, it's really crucial, especially now, because everyone is so nervous and everything, to be kind, to be kind to each other and, you know, to be kind to people we don't know and to other people on the streets, in the post office, in the supermarket, and to really to be kind and to be and try to be kind even if you don't want to be kind and because then it calms down the situation kind of and then other you force other people to be kind to you as well uh so i think it, this is really it, it is almost as a subversive activity today and agree. yeah and you know I, I think it's timothy snyder who has yeah. said and i'm sure others who have no, said that like true. fascism uh thrives when we don't trust each other so, I mean, even the, the ability to come here and have a conversation and learn about your amazing project, which is just absolutely wonderful. Um, these are the moments where, where, where we, we, we're fighting fascism right here in our small way. I think it matters. Well, uh, now we came to, to fascism and anti-fascism. Now I would like to ask you something um, Okay, we have all those uh, rebellious acts, uh, small, mezzo or the, the 
uh, highest level. But um, when we are talking about all those uh, ancient now dilemmas about what could we do in this system in the kind of uh, uh, democracy or um, we have uh, some uh, some shrinking space for, for doing actions or participating in different uh, institutions. For example, I believe Militiana would also agree with me that in post Yugoslav space, uh, every institution is corrupted. We can't believe in, uh, in, not, uh, in, in, in any one of those institutions. So democracy is also in crisis in whichever kind of democracy we are talking now. But I would like next to speak to you maybe about um, some um, alliances on the left. Uh, so what can we do to to like wider, widen those alliances and not to uh, go into fight uh, between each other? Sometimes we don't have constructive dialogues. So what are you doing in LA to make uh, uh, space for dialogue between different parts of the left movement and also Anemilica? What do you think? what we are doing and what could be done in our space to make some debates more fruitful and not like hostile, like sometimes uh, in also in time of crisis and fascism, we are um, hostile sometimes more than we should be or we don't have to be at all in, in that kind of um, unproductive debate. So in which, whichever order you would like to answer me, you can. I, I'll talk a little bit about um, kind of, I, and this is not a specific Los Angeles, but a United States uh, example of, of one of the things that's happening and that Artists for Democracy has been engaged with. Um, and that is uh, a lot of the, the best and most important organizing that's happening politically is grassroots organizers in communities of color. Um, people who are doing organizing within their own communities uh, and doing that on the ground door to door, knocking on doors. You talked about the importance of just sitting down and talking with people. And that is something that that has to be done at a grassroots and a peer to peer level. And so what we find is we've been supporting organizations that their entire purpose is to simply raise money and give it to those grass or grassroots organizations. Um, and that's something that, that Artists for Democracy has supported uh, to, to, to let's, you know, these grassroots organizations, they understand the communities that they serve, they understand the issues better than we can. And, you know, coming from California, like nobody in Georgia wants people from California telling them what to do, let me tell you. So, but if we, but they'll happily take our money and we will happily give it to folks in Georgia who are doing that on the ground direct organizing. And, um, and that's, 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 that's happening more and more nationally. Um, it's uh, kind of, we, we talk about allyship um, and being stronger allies with, with those communities. Um, and that's a big, a, a really important thing that's happening in the United States and has really since 2018, I think, has been, there's been a huge growth in that. So you are collecting money and just giving uh, it to, to some other people and they have all the freedom to do whatever they want with that. They, what they think yes. it's and, needed. And this, is <laughs> this is entirely volunteer citizen organized uh, uh, groups that are doing this that, um, have sat down, they've looked at the numbers, they, they go to the experts who know like, where are the seats in the Senate or in Congress? Where would they be most effective? Like mm -hmm. where would the money, um, you know, just, just a little bit of money could, because ah, money is so important in politics. It's so frustrating, isn't it? Um, and so identifying those communities, finding out who, what are the community groups that are doing that relational organizing, that face-to-face, peer-to-peer -peer organizing and just give them money and, and trust that they know what's best for their mm -hmm. in their communities. I'm asking you that, that because a lot of our NGOs and a lot of activists from uh, our context are doing with some kind of European bureaucracy or some uh, funding that is uh, suffocating our activism at the end uh, with a lot of a lot, a lot of bureaucratization. Sometimes some ideas that are just put in our context uh, aren't um, 
uh, I'm doing any good. Uh, um, on the contrary, uh, they are just um, so, so th th that's what you were talking was very inspiring for me. And it could be uh, used as a model just to, to give the, the communities that are needed some um, funds or uh, some resources. But uh, what they are doing, it's on them because they know the best and not from the up uh, some bureaucratical system, which is giving them some funds. And at the end, what is the result of all that? Uh, thank you. And now, Anne and Nilica, maybe you want to give some examples or? Uh, um, regarding the uh, uh, dialogues, I think from my, our experience, we're active in, on the, uh, this NGO scene or independent art scene for 20 years. As you said, institutions were corrupt, which might be an interesting situation to try and think about of the alternative institutional forms. Yeah, because it's visible that all the top management of major institutions in culture in our field, but can you imagine in other fields, are placed by the polit uh, party in power. So not based on relevance and, uh, and <clears throat> capacity or ideas, but based on, uh, of, on the political motivation. So we that probably that situation was forced us to think about and learn alternative ways of organizing operating and so on and so on and from my personal experience in the last being active for quite a long number of years and this scene not only in serbia but in ex-yugoslavia region the things are shifting in on the level of trust between people that through working together, we get to know each other. At the beginning, we were all very strict in our positions and very, very firm. And I think it's generally, if we think more generally, problem with ego. I see it with myself when I say, oh, I am not very interested in artists anymore because it's a big, but I'm talking it from the very egoistic position with artists present. And I'm not aware of that. It's kind of, it's, it's we are trapped in this, culture of ego which was imposed on and we don't know the alternative what 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 will what um, uh, what capacity or potential this other side of us which is not so egoistic has uh, but i i see the change i think we were all trapped in those positions firmly holding our positions the critical positions and with this and that and always being in conflict and hardly able to collaborate and work things together but i think my personal experience that that situation is changing with my colleagues and seeing in the past 10 15 years i changed much more understanding and willingness to listen to each other try to understand each other and try to work together i i i'm i'm witnessing that but i don't maybe i'm just an op i am an optimist yeah <laughs> maybe she will give some kind of no i think you're right in in that yes, yes. Regarding the dialogue between within the left, let's say. Yeah. Well, um, maybe we can talk a little bit about that. Uh, the main theme of this talk series about conspiracy theories, because I learned from Nebuch and some uh, talks before this that there are different uh, approaches to conspiracy theories. So maybe, um, Bronwyn, you could um, explain to us um, some differences in approaching those problems. What is your position? Of course, you, you were talking about it that in your um, uh, talk, but maybe now you can go uh, into some uh, differences, how, how we should um, uh, approach uh, conspiracy theories. That would be interesting, I think, for us also. Um. I mean, I find myself and I've, I've read a number of articles and listened to the talks and kind of this deconstructing the concept of conspiracy theory. And one of those things you go so deep where you can't see it anymore. Um, what, what, it, what, what was, and having to step back and ask yourself, what was the problem that made, made us interested in looking at this? And what, what is it? Because there is something bad going on. There is misinformation and disinformation and propaganda being shared um and i have 
begun to wonder whether a conspiracy, conspiracy theories are merely a vessel that people are putting their thing in. And is it the conspiracy theory itself or is it the content that we need to focus on? Um, and when, when I get myself so turned around inside that I can't figure that, that, that I'm asking myself, is it misinformation? Is it disinformation? Is it propaganda? Is it conspiracy theory? I go back to where I was in my talk. And I look at, is there, a, is there harm being done? People are not getting vaccines and they are putting themselves at terrible risk because they have been given bad information in the form of conspiracy theories. But they're getting bad information in other ways as well. Um, you know, so I think that it's helpful for us when we're trying to figure out what is what is what is the problem we're trying to solve for is is to look for the harm that's being done or where if people are being harmed then let's work our way backwards to where the harm is coming from. And if, if it is some kind of bad information um, that someone is sharing accidentally because they saw it on Facebook and they're worried, I need to share this with my friends because I don't want them to be hurt and their intent is good and they believe what they've been told, then it's, not a, then it's a different uh, intervention than if it is, a state actor or a non-state actor that is intentionally putting bad information in the world and trying to, to whatever it is they're trying to do, um, but looking, but without looking at intent, but looking at effects and working backwards from it. And I think that may be helpful for us to get beyond. You know, there, I've read these articles that talk about conspiracy thinking, conspiracy, conspiracism, conspiracy narratives. I've, of course, as a writer, I'm very interested in the idea of conspiracy narratives and want to look into that more. But let's, let's look at the harm and work backwards. Okay. Uh, and Anna and Milica, do you have uh, any um, ideas or what is your approach to conspiracy theories? What's most uh, complicated thing about it uh, when I'm thinking about conspiracy theories? Uh, I also am um, falling in trap uh, not to have a patience, enough patience to speak with people. Uh, I'm just like, well, just get vaccinated. But I know, know that that's not fr fruitful political action. So maybe you have some um, kind of ideas what could we do or what you are doing. The, about that in your work? I actually started thinking, you know, more about conspiracy theories. I mean, we are all thinking, I guess, all the time about them because we are so surrounded. I mean, globally, we are so surrounded with them. And not only since COVID started, but maybe I started thinking more about them uh, when Nebuisha invited us to participate in this uh, event. And then I watched your, um, uh, the the participants of the of the project and I was quite fascinated and you know there is something really fascinating about conspiracy theories because they're like fantastic fictions and when you approach them like that they they become really interesting and I think that maybe their power is very much in into that fictional character of conspiracy theories because people need fiction really need and and when you think how many how little people read then you have this like you know uh ready to go literature in a way so and and so so i think it's of course it's it's very easy you know just to dismiss them and say you know all these people who don't in for example in this specific case for anti-vaxxers they're just lunatics and you know personally i think they're you know there is something wrong with them and you know um but i became interested in in hearing them out you know uh you know hearing these stories how if you get pfizer then you the metal will stick to this arm and if you get sinopharm it will stick to the i mean it's fascinating and people really do believe that so there is something uh and then you know of course i guess as hundreds and thousands of people when COVID started, I took, you know, all the books dealing with epidemics, like starting from the fall on. And 
it's always the same. It's always the same. People, there is something fascinating, but people need that kind of fiction, and it goes for centuries. And um, so I guess we need, you know, if we want more people to get to be vaccinated, we need more stronger fiction in a way, you know, like like or crazier fiction, saying, you know. I don't know what, but there, I, I, I don't think they could be just, you know, dismissed like that. Said, so, you know, said so to say these old people are lonely because I read a, a survey that you know most of the people who are actually spreading uh, anti-vaccine campaign globally are people who are coming from IT sector. So they are educated, you know, they're really educated, and they are kind of they are not paid to do that. They are, they really believe in that. So they are, you know, IT sector and. Um, have and like engineers or something like that. I mean, it was really bizarre, really bizarre. But that is like that was like a global survey. So, you know, th th there is something. Uh, uh, yeah, there is something there. Uh, I think that Darko Suing was uh, at Rex some of the Rex program this year or maybe some uh, years before. Uh, Nebusha would know better. And uh, he's a literary theoretician, but uh, he's talking about utopias, dystopias, anti-utopias, etc., uh, utopias, uh, etc. And uh, um, one important thing in his theory, one of important thing I think, is um, when he says that capitalism is making uh, us think that there is no alternative. So even not a critical dystopia, that's not a possibility. Uh, uh, something, some other utopian society, that's also not a possibility. The only possibility is this reality. So when we are thinking about uh, those narratives, what you, Anna, just said, uh, if those narratives are, they are problematic, but they are giving some kind of parallel you know, <laughs> reality. I don't know how to say it, but I can, I can understand the power of narrative and that's why i would like now to ask you uh, what power of different narratives we could use for example in contemporary literature you have uh, poetics uh, when you have novels with uh, five to ten or uh, people from the margins but not one voice but uh, they are incorporating different voices uh, like 10 or 15, 12 years ago in a Western literary, literary canon, you just have one perspective of white cis European man. And that was so like um, poor, poorly written prose in a way. We, we missed so much. But now I can see the changes in the narratives uh, that are multiplying in a way. In the theory, those uh, perspectives are called intersectionality i don't know uh, you have different uh, aspects of the this theory but for me it is interesting to think about different uh, different possibilities of uh, capitalism and not, not just this this uh, um uh, this space we are now and for um, the multiplicity of voices are helping uh, in in that processes of create thinking so uh, my question for Brawin would be, uh, what do you think now in USA, what are uh, good aspects and backlashes of so-called intersectional um, approaches to art, uh, um, to politics, etc.? We spoken today uh, with the, uh, about the problem of tokenism in politics, when uh, those different voices are misused, etc. So maybe you can give us a little bit of uh, uh, your context about what, what all those different voices could, could give us in um, conceptualizing different spaces. And of course, Anna and Milica, maybe you can tell us something about our own context and multiple voices we are hearing now in progressive movements. And also, I would like to, to add, uh, if someone from Belgrade now, because I can't see, want to ask something or intervene, please then we should just uh, tell me and those People can raise a hand, and people who are on Zoom could raise, a, like, this kind of digital hand, or just write in the chat, and we will give you opportunity to ask some questions. So, Bronwyn, Anna Milica, what can we do with multiple voices? I, I mean, it's an it, it's a great question. I one of the things that you're seeing in the United States right now in the arts is uh, you're many, many more voices 
of people of color, many more artists are being uh, being published. I mean, there are more um, African American women writers being published. I think right now than 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 we've ever seen. Um, I see a lot of African American. Latinx, Asian uh, artists who, whose work is being promoted by some of the the most mainstream arts organizations. Their work is being purchased, it's being hung on walls, it's being promoted online. One of the things that has facilitated that a bit to some degree has been the problem of uh, of, of, of COVID, which is that we've all been online. And so there have been a lot of opportunities for artists whose work has never been seen before to, um, to, to appear digitally and to be shared more widely. As I, um, in, in Los Angeles has been fairly well locked down for most of the, uh, the, the pandemic and it's only been in the last month or two that museums have begun, and galleries have begun to reopen. And so what we're seeing on the walls is very different from what we were seeing on the walls in January and February of 2020. And so there's there's a lot of hope. There's also a lot of fear. And I, 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 I hesitate to speak for a community that I don't represent, but I have heard people who fear that this is this, that they are being tokenized, that this is this is the museum embracing the work of artists of color. So to, to give themselves some some street cred so that they look good and uh, that this there's fear that this won't last. So I think that we embrace the moment uh, to to really see and hear and listen to those voices and to and to find out what we've been missing. I think the other thing, the other thing I want to talk about, and I hate talking about television, but television is dramatically changing and has during during COVID um, in the US and there is work by and starring um, more people of color than than we've ever seen before. However, we're also seeing an incredible uh, breaking apart of, you know, we're not all watching the same shows and uh, and so Whatever someone's interested in, they probably just dropped a new show about it on Netflix yesterday, um, and it's probably a ten-part series, and it'll be you know picked up again when those ten episodes have shown. So, so at the same time that that we are seeing more more of those artists who who have not had an opportunity to be seen in the past, we're also seeing kind of a breakup of our um, of kind of it. it our viewing habits. So we may not all be seeing the same things, even though those folks work is is more visible and more available. So um, I think that uh, it's a little bit incumbent upon us to uh, to 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 seize the moment um, to as viewers to let museums know that the work has that that work is meaningful to us that we've taken something away from it um, and to support uh, uh, to support those writers to buy their books, please buy more books. Um, all writers want you to buy their books, um, and uh, and and to ensure that to to take the moment to listen. You know, I, I'm going to go and reference back to to your project um, that one of the things you've done and you've gone and listened to people. What an amazing thing to do! And so we have an opportunity to to listen to new voices, and um, and we should take we should take that. Okay, thank you. And what about the problem of tokenism? How how we could um, overcome it, maybe, and misuses of uh, those multi perspectives? Is there a way to to just overcome it? Or one of the things that we taught that um, in my day job working uh, working for local government in the Department of Arts and Culture is that. We ask ourselves, are the communities that we're serving, are the people who are appearing on panels, the people that we're hiring, do they look like the community? And that means not that there's one person and they have to represent all people of color, but if in Los Angeles, 50% of the population is Latino, then 50% of the panel should be Latino. And uh, and looking at how we, how we make up those, uh, how the opportunities that we have we make sure that we give them uh, in a way that is representative of the community. I think that's a starting point, um, but I think this is going to be 
uh, a struggle that we're not going to resolve in the short term. I think this is something that 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 we have to have to work on. Thank you. We had similar um, practices in, but just in idea in socialist Yugoslavia, it wasn't uh, never fully developed. Uh, it was uh, self management. So people were uh, like uh, presenting themselves and their, their communities and their factories, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. That was uh, I see some uh, ideas which were very contemporary in socialist Yugoslavia, but you know, we had the 90s and the fall of um, all those ideas. So now we have uh, Uber uh, neo socialist uh, system. So, but thank you. And Dan and Milica, maybe you can tell us something about uh, multiple voices on cultural scenes, on engagement, uh, uh, engaging arts, and Etc. And what are the problems with tokenism? If you um, can see some of them. Well, as, as an artist, I must say that I'm I'm not sure that this issue of tokenism will ever be overcome because you always have another group jumping in, and we all remember that um, in the 90s we were that group. So, uh, or people from Eastern Europe, and then people from Yugoslavia, from ex-Yugoslavia, and, and I mean, so it's it's always there. It sells. Um, but as for the for the multiple voices, I think that this is extremely important moment to have more and more voices in the art field represented in the art field. And I think it's extremely, in, even if it is tokenism, I think it's it's important moment that it's important for people to, you know, start being aware that there is a different, that there are different perspectives. So we, we should really cherish that moment. But I think that in a way we have a, a, a rather different problem and it is different voices or different opinions coming into the art spaces um, as, as spectators or as a public. Uh, so I think this is always, the, the, for me, this is always a larger issue, how we have this, um, these different uh, uh, voices in the public and not only this traditional public that we are kind of always facing with. So I think that's, the, that's always the huge problem. I'm not so familiar with the notion tokenism. That means tokenism, I'm sorry, would somebody- Oh, that means when you have like um, one, um, um, one representative of so-called marginalized group, which is uh, most, um, which is uh, in a kind representing all the group, um, maybe in some politics it could be our prime minister you know she is a one woman or maybe she's lesbian and now that she's a token of how our ah, uh, government is prog is progressive you ah, know? Okay, okay okay that's what that means uh-huh okay um it's um wow tokenism <laughs> what a nice or nice or strange way to put this type of yeah kind of corruption or manipulation with the uh, uh, suffering and or, or struggles of the all deprived groups uh, it's, it's like so i would say i would say it's um i wanted just to refer to conspiracy theories in anti-vax and all these stories which are coming and kind of uh, occupying certain certain uh, 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 disappointment of huge number of people. Maybe we can look at that as some kind of anti-system, uh, anti-systematic act, act against the system. So I won't take vaccine. And as Richard Wolf say, say, say put, put really nicely, they all those people who are anti-vax, they they not. They took fifty vaccines in their lives so far. If they have a problem of appendix, they will go to the hospital to have an operation. So it's not about that. It's something else. And I think that is important. And regarding like these multiple voices, I really do believe we should start um, 
that this story about multiple voices and uh, deprived groups, marginalized groups, rights, human rights, equalities, should now start, and it is already, which is very hopeful, being analyzed from the perspective of economical distribution, not recognition of difference, which was the dominant, uh, 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 the, the dominant position of the human rights. Uh, uh, movements, um, but from the economic distribution, like who is deprived, empower, empower, impoverished people, poor people who don't have right for to education, people who have uh, who don't have uh, economic uh, uh, um, uh, environment in which they can they ha they don't have equal access as the people who probably white middle class men, not not to speak only about gender, but also any other minority which don't have the equal right and so on but also and i think to approach this topic again from anti-capitalistic position so to challenge the system that continuously reproduce these inequalities and where is the, where the money who gets money how gets money because if you have an impoverished community we should talk about poor and rich and not about white black me okay i understand in america it's a big issue when i went to america i was in sh really stunned by how how big issue is uh, uh, uh various different ethnic racial divides but i think if we should overlook those divides for, and unite on the economic the, the distribution of means and, and access to 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 uh, normal conditions of life then we can find the common ground, I think. And also the huge issue, I would say, we today, we are living in the world when people became uh, 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 live, alive people, like we have one of the biggest migration flows in the recent history. These hundreds of millions of people are on movement for already we witnessed here in Serbia from 2015, I would say, but probably much longer behind, but it's still going on. We know, we see what's going on in Belarus and Poland, where living people became the, uh, the, val uh, the, 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 the uh, uh, kind of tool for political uh, 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 confrontations. If one person put 15,000 migrants on the border, we have this huge flow of people who are being pushed, the defenses are being brought up, they're being tortured, they're being deprived of any kind of and any human rights, and they're sort of invisible. European Union, Union is raising fans all around to prevent these people on movement. Uh, to to reach their countries, which is a huge issue. So what and this big movement of people coming mostly from Syria, Afghanistan, Iraq, Iran, all those countries, a huge movement, millions of people drowning in Mediterranean seas, you know, facing horrific treatment by the border police on various different countries all over the globe. So what does this movement mean? It's 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 a, re it's a reality. People are moving, They're and are going through huge suffering. I would say horrific conditions. And you see the politics of 20th century in in uh, operation op, in in operation. The governments are reacting like it's been like uh, in the logic of the 20th century i would say and not on the 21st so how what do we do with these people these people are, have objective need to go out we face that during the war in in in, in ex-yugoslavia in certain various different situations either our families or people we know were in the position to move to leave their homes you leave their home when you're really livingly endangered it's not like you're doing it for fun. Those people are in threatening situation and the, their only way out is to leave. And they are on the move and we are ignoring that fact. So what's their voice? Where is their voice? And how is that movement, this huge movement of people affect the, the, the countries that they go through or where they will arrive and so on and so on. So I think, um, I think the things, I think, 
slowly and, and also on the daily level you see many people interacting i see on my local market my local seller and the green market is talking pakistani with some guys there they already learned the language because it's such a huge flow so many people pass through green it's called zeleni venets uh, market big spot for the migrants in the past so people already know the language they have some kind of communication and the people who are passing through oh they have a smile on their face because somebody talked to them nicely so there are things so this uh, the, the change is happening how will i don't think it's articulated or it's conscious but it's going on so in 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 regard to multiple voices i don't know what to say i think that's absolutely necessary and you see like we had this uh, gender issues like young women starting to talk about their abuse in serbia we had that in the past but it is it's 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 a relevant issue that women were abused we live in patriarchy patriarchal capitalist society so all the flaws are now becoming more and more visible and i think every experience as you said you're riding a bicycles i didn't ride much bicycle when i was but my daughters do even in america my daughter in houston she rides a bike my daughter in zagreb rides a bike and it, i didn't teach them that so there is some progress happening independently, I would say, but it is an act of rebellion. And I think this, all those small changes compared with the big issues that we will face and global warming and everything is, will bring us to the new solutions. But I, I see that people are, it's not articulating in the, articulated in the policy. Just the COVID crisis was so badly managed by all the governments across the globe. Total failure for, from my side with all the governments. So yeah, uh, yeah. I, I, uh, when you say from my side, I, I thought that you would uh, would say like from the side or, or, or from the side of working people. I, I'm like uh, because from the side of capitalists, uh, this uh, handle of crisis was. Excellent. They gained a lot of much, uh, a lot of um, money they weren't having like two or three years before the crisis. So from their perspective, they managed it perfectly. From our perspective, sure, they managed, we are so. Uh, uh, I think that's important when we are talking about different perspectives. Uh, we are talking about uh, marginalized or uh, some perspectives that are important to us. But we also have to think about. Uh, that um, all those right-wing ideas, uh, they are going in line with uh, capitalist interests. And that's what Nebuchadnezzar is always talking like, okay, we are talking about fascists, we are talking about fascists, but we are sometimes forgetting about uh, when we are in capitalism. Uh, that's a system which is also producing fascism, of course, that, that's uh, what the uh, Frankfurt School was talking like 80 years ago. But we are repeating the same mistakes. We are just reacting on a, a concrete fascism. But when we have capitalism all around us, on every level, on every structure, or from interpersonal relations to the mezzo and macro relations, what are we doing against that, against the systematic um, inequality? I think, uh, Milica, you were talking about those uh, aspects uh, to one hour ago when you were talking about systematic uh, um, inequalities in capitalism so th that's what's uh, what's making me think uh, like what, what what are we doing now and all those uh, you were saying uh, war, uh, climate warm, warning warming and uh, now we are calling it the climate uh, crisis or climate uh, cat catastrophe that's like the most contemporary um metaphor you are we are using a catastrophe it's not like warming it's not like even it's not a crisis it's like happening now so what should we do and like two weeks ago no 10 days ago in um in uh, united kingdom uh, they had in glasgow they had the, the, this meeting where the capitalists from all around the globe uh, came together uh, to make a deal for themselves and they were doing a lot of greenwashing but uh in the contrast to them a lot of young people were like uh engaging and protesting like uh Bromin said at the beginning of her talk they were uh, engaging in like 
we don't want this kind of greenwashing. We want the real action. So maybe if there aren't any questions from the public, we could uh, finish with uh, uh, with the questions uh, with my question about uh, ecology, about different uh, generational movements. What do you think of, of them? And if you have to ask each other some questions, be free to do it. Maybe I just missed something, something that is important for you. Anna, Milica, Bronwyn, you could ask each other whatever you want. And of course, if you would like to answer me on the questions about new movements, which are very interconnected with the ecological movements. They are not ideal. Sometimes we know in Serbia they are connected with nationalist ideas, like we are, um, um, we want to save our Serbia. I don't know if you, Anna, Milica, Nebiš, maybe you um, noticed that, some kind of nationalistic green politics. Uh, which are frightening in a way, but but now I'm talking about leftists to, to finish this conversation in an open and constructive way. Now I'm talking about leftist and progressive movement. That's it for me. Maybe you would like to to answer or question put a question. Because I'm talking, I feel like I'm again talking too much. I just I don't think that the capitalist the cap this system, as you said, I said it's badly the crisis is badly managed but i think even in if for the system itself it's bad uh, for me it looks like the capitalism the roof is leaking and the capitalist system there is the the the, the respond to that is fixing the ceiling uh, fixing the cellar or fixing the facade they're just not tackling the problem which is not without consequence that's why i'm saying the system is crashing because system is unable to perceive the reality of the circumstances in which it operates. It continues to operate on the same logic that was accurate in the last century, but not in this century. So it, it, it's crashing. The consequences we don't know, I, that's, my, that's how I see it. So the capitalism, I don't even think that they managed good for themselves because the, the, the consequences of badly managed pandemic, global pandemic, will be economic crash, which already is predicted to be much stronger, more severe than it ever was in 2008. Economists said is nothing toward any, the thing that is, kept, is ahead of us, not to mention the challenges of global warming. I mean, you can cover it up, but the roof, when you don't fix the leaking roof, it's going to grow, 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 and the, and the, and the roof will fall. And something has to happen <clears throat> but i think so yeah um i'm i think this is like all empires that are falling apart they don't see the reality and they try to reproduce themselves as they did before that they were so successful and now it's not working so it's going to be a, a huge space for all the alternatives i think but the consequences we don't know but i think things are changing There was one uh, comment. Mm -hmm. oh, that's uh, there was one comment uh, about uh, it said uh, it was uh, it is easier to to talk about uh, Illuminati reptiles <laughs> than about uh, Republican think tanks, for example. Like it is easier to transfer the problematic narrative into some sort of mythological or uh, fictional at least uh, uh, to say uh, uh, appearance than to go into maybe uh, language is itself deprived of capacity to address uh, the problems I mean uh, language uh, goes uh, on uh, with the rule of uh, a smaller uh, resistance you know it goes there where it is easier to, for even physically like, like it, it develops so in a way that it is easier and easier to be spoken but also on a, uh, a level of concepts and ideas how to address now now when we know where the problem is we lack lack words we lack and this is why i think that stories are important then the later said i asked is it question no no it is just about uh, uh, one of the speakers said that fiction might be the point of the reason why uh, these wild conspiracy theories are, are so widespread. Yes, people need stories. Story is still the most powerful media. Story. So, uh, like, 
uh, I think that uh, the, the, the existence of so-called conspiracy theories, not to enter now into their uh, uh, like semiotic or whichever phenomenological theoretical analysis, is due to need of, of uh, huge, let's say, portion of populations worldwide to get some even comforting story. Even they don't have to trust in it. Because uh, today's discussion in Institute for Philosophy, uh, Social Theory, I, I didn't manage to wrap up, but it would be like uh, the like the most problematic stories. The, the reason for their existence are valid. The reasons for their existence exist. They are not invented. They are not. Uh, they are not uh, a result of some conspiracy. But the argumentation that comes out, the facade, is bizarre for a variety of reasons, sometimes like a provocation, sometimes like incapacity of language of, uh, to address the real issues, and sometimes because of infantile uh, uh, fears that people are easier with it. I mean, there is a lot of things to be addressed, and I think that we should be interested in phenomena because it opens some capacity of analysis for us. This is where the Institute could find its very a very, very productive purpose. Really, I mean, it is like some symptom that we are afraid of, but I mean, there is the way to understand why it exists, why it is so uh, like uh, resilient. Yeah, in the end, it's it's like, uh, it's there. We cannot, we cannot, that is, yes. And in the end, maybe, maybe when it is about democracy and tokenism, that was my short comment, maybe. What if, uh, as Professor uh, Wolfwood said, there's no democracy without economic democracy. And what would be economic democracy? It's not just distribution. It's realization of uh, human personality. You know, like it's, it's much more uh, demanding how, how to make a society of realized personalities, not just people that have everything. This will bring us to consumer society of some higher level. You know? And I think that uh, in, in, in that aspect, it's very interesting to see if democracy itself is tokenized, you say. We all agree that only a few percent of people decide about everything, own everything, control the political system, and we accept that they call it democracy, which would be the rule of the people. What if, what if the entire system is tokenized, taken and misused and misinterpreted with very important world like the rule of the people, let's say. And also, I think that in American tradition, there are very strong tools to address it, to, to not to let, because the first amendment goes the rule of government by the people, for the people, or in the name of the people, how it goes. Like, it is so important sentence, you know, and we somehow overlook it. <laughs> in the next step, we just forget about it. And I think that there is, at least there is a chance to not to forget it and not to give it up. And I think that your project really opened that issue here. Why, how to do democracy, how to do democracy. If we, and I also want to <laughs> like mention, my feeling in LA, riding bike is maybe comparable to feeling of ordinary citizens being offered democracy as it is. So on a bicycle in LA, I felt in universe that is not made for me. The roads are too long, you don't get anywhere. The roads are dangerous. The signage is giant, you know, it is not for you to ride bicycle, it's for some other, you know, creatures that of course ride 80 miles, you know, you, you, they don't ride slow, you ride, 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 and there is one billboard, you approach, approach, otherwise you sit in few seconds, you know, it's totally like, uh, like a dwarf, you know, like in the world of giants. So maybe people see, feel like that in democracy, you know, they, the signage is powerful, infrastructure is uh, uh, so magnificent, so un uncomprehensible. If you go from one to another part of the city, you're just, just shocked how huge it is. It's, it's something like 100 kilometers, 500 kilometers. And it is in a language, it lives in a one space, one place. I mean, people know that it is by space. Anyway, I think that this is maybe nice, also an artistic like, metaphor to find out uh, how distant this system is, how demanding people give up, people don't want to engage. They engage now because Trump offered them 
I think uh, enough of, uh, you know, like uh, uh, <laughs> enough of conspiracy theories about everything. So to, to everybody, it's like, okay, it's enough, you know. But before that, and now we see after elections in Virginia, in New Jersey, you know, it is getting again an economy. What did you offer? What did you give to majority of people? Did you give them easier credits? Did you give them uh, easier uh, mortgage, mortgages? Did you offer them uh, education? You know, no, nothing happened. So people get uninterested. Oh, this is infrastructure. That's not, but it's no. And then, and then again, we are obliged to intervene and to fight because even if we if we lose this. You know, like this obviously alienated and like problematized system, it it might, it for sure will become even worse. So it's a dialectical situation. Yeah, Nebuch, uh, I just wanted to add a little bit. When, when we are talking about democracy, um, I think that the first association with that we uh, get to know is democracy at national level, like on the level USA, on the level of Serbia, I don't know. But first of all, we need to have democracy on the local level. And, and very developed democracy, because that is something which is directly uh, in, um, connected with my own life, you know, on the one level. And on the other level, democracy couldn't be achieved in one um, isolated space, like, um, I don't know, New Zealand or Scotland or, or um, um, Sweden, or uh, it is international question. So without democracy in USA, in Serbia, in Afghanistan, etc., etc., we couldn't have democracy. So when we are thinking, okay, I'm, I'm going to vote in Serbia, for example, now, yeah? Yeah, but I don't have a right to vote, I don't know, in America, because that's just not my national country. I don't have a right to tell people in the United Kingdom, oh, what are you doing with Brexit? But what they are doing with Brexit had direct consequences on us, like what when they were voting for Margaret Thatcher, that really had a great, um, uh, great um, um, uh, consequences on all of us. So, you know, it's uh, what is uh, the democracy can't be achieved on the national level, just, just on that level. That's, that's my question. I would like to it, think it about is... democracy. If like, he's provocative, okay. sorry, Zizek, yeah. the, uh, uh, American elections are so important worldwide, and so maybe won't change that much in the United States that all the world would, would should vote on that election, yeah. except, except Americans, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Well, that, that it's, just, it's, not me, but it's, it's a good little point, you know, like how important this is why we follow the elections. We know everything about <laughs> gerrymandering and this and that, you know, like get worried about everything. And we have totally help, helpless, you know, what can we do? Nothing. Here. Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to think about that. All those democracy are really interconnected with the, the colonial history. So United States of America uh, were, um, you know, when they were um, independent, they were independent from the United Kingdom, but uh, on the other hand, the Latin America was colonized at the same instant. So when we are talking about democracy, we can't, uh, can't overthink the consequences of colonization. That, 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 that was my, uh, my um, little comment, sorry. Uh, maybe uh, Bronwyn could add something about America. Or... Want to respond to but we don't have time but I, I one of the things I do want to say is I, I think that one of the things to really it's so important to understand about the United States is that that we have never reckoned with our own civil war we have never fully reckoned with uh, what the the states that were torn apart then are the states that are torn apart today the issues of slavery and the impact of slavery uh, on the people who were enslaved we have never fully acknowledged it. There's never been any kind of reconciliation. The Electoral College, for those of you who have to follow our elections and understand the deep problems of the Electoral College and the damage it's doing, it is a vestige of slavery. So understanding the United States means understanding that, our, our, that we have yet to reckon with those things. And in American history, it seems like a long time ago, the 1860s, I think for Serbian history, it's just yesterday in terms of time, but uh, but but I think that it, it 
understanding that can help you to think about uh, about the um, it, it can help us also to understand some of the conspiracy theories that are floating around in the United States and the fears. And I, I do agree that uh, I, I mean, fear is one of the things that motivates us to do the worst things as human beings. Um, so uh, to understand our, our, our complex race issues in the US, we've got to understand that we've never come to terms with, with our history of slavery and with the Civil War. We need to with our Civil Wars, <laughs> if this of course. Oh, well, um, we've been hunted for, uh, for three decades now, which maybe seems like a, a small period of time, but it's not it's all my lifetime. So. Um, okay, uh, Anna, I do you want something to ask uh, so, or conclude in every way you want? I just want to thank Nebisha and Bronwyn and Melissa for, for, uh, for inviting us to take part. It was really brilliant, this encounter and hearing of all your work in the US. It's so important. All the support for you to continue. And it's really nice having you here in Belgrade. And thank you, Nadja, for doing yeah. such a great job from yes, Tirana. Uh, we have an, a question from on Zoom. Uh, Anja Radojkovic, so if you want to ask a question, just unmute or maybe, okay. Okay, uh, I was kind of debating whether I should comment or not, because I have the feeling that my English is a little bit rusty, but I'll be short, I promise. Uh, it was regarding Nebuchadnezzar's comment that American elections have uh, impact on all of us. And I agree because I remember when Trump was elected and he was propagating that global warming is a uh, conspiracy theory. And he annulled every, uh, every contract that his predecessors had signed. And now we have an impact on all of us because of that. Uh, I also have a comment regarding one of the speakers said that Serbian people are uh, a nation which uh, protests a lot. I agree with that. We are on the streets all the time. But I believe that we should have some uh, education regarding quality pro protest because I have the feeling that uh, most of our uh, protests are unsuccessful. Thank you, Anna. Uh, Anna, uh, we understood everything, so don't worry. Uh, does some of you want to, to add a comment uh, on this? I know it was a comment, it wasn't maybe a question, but of course, when you, when you were talking about uh, Trump and uh, uh, now uh, in you say, are you having Green New Deal or are you aren't not uh, aren't having it? I don't know what Biden is uh, doing about that. But we now have a problem with Rio Tinto and multinational companies which are getting uh, in this region and um, they aren't eco ecologically, uh, you know, su sustainable. They, they are just like from from hell, like some worse uh, multinational. But Nebuish wants something to show us. Yeah. Nebuish. <laughs> Uh, it is maybe Bronwyn uh, should uh, or Melissa uh, just uh, explain shortly. The, but this is what we got and we, what you can find in our center uh, before we move, because we will move again. Uh, um, we join the flow of migrants unintentionally. So um, uh, this is uh, this is uh, uh, seeing material in development of in, in by institute. Institute for Analysis of Conspiracy Theories or Institute for Conspiracy Theory Analysis. I don't know, is it exactly the same meaning? But anyway, um, this is uh, um, um, this resembles and it is made according to the uh, models or let's say um, um, patterns or uh, templates of very old magazines from Kansas. You said, by the way, Kansas was the disputable state in electoral uh, struggle before the <laughs> Civil War. <laughs> anyway, uh, this, is, uh, th this is for me interesting because this is exactly what we do here to somehow present this project. We will produce some co co fake tabloid, 
finally something to be to be fake <laughs> from this weapon of the enemy to say you know we will produce fake tabloids with all truth on the scientific truth the most boring thing that you can imagine and but this is something else this is subverting some narratives and introducing conspiracy theory term in some text from uh, uh, from all newspapers or with some sort of subversive intervention interventions it's uh, 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 let's say more recent issues quotation marks more recent so it is interesting to see how art and we would probably try to work on this further our center to see how art can enter this debate at all most of us are allergic i'm allergic to whatever conspiracy theory it is personally but i have to struggle with my own subjective but i saw i realized that it's much more to this than just rejection and ignorance and uh, you know like uh, demonization because this is this is what fits that phenomenon i mean this is what because the the so the problem is not there in that narrative is somewhere else and this narrative is getting empowered with denial with the rejection with the you know like humiliation what are you doing today on a conference there was about psychological part you know this is favorite like these people are you know not that in that good shape we, this is the most dangerous some uh, scientists seriously call it on the edge of eugenics when we start to go into this these people are not capable of understanding etc and frederick jameson one of the first theoreticians said what is conspiracy theory this is cognitive mapping of poor then you know you, you just say no i have to start from the beginning you know like who like, you know why there are poor people you know why their cognitive mapping is different than ours is it our problem as well or is it just their problem you know so it, this is here in rex and I hope that uh, we will develop a collaboration with the Brownman and Melissa Institute as well, because we, we want, we cannot expect, escape, even if we want, you know, it, it, they are there, they are around us, they are uh, approaching there, and also they, are with, they have very different agendas that uh, are uh, sometimes not that uh, easily detectable, and not that is as uh, uh, Jody Dean put it, Come on, we are all conspired. It's just a question in which conspiracy we are, you know, like for everybody somehow joining with somebody else. Oh, is it now, of course, I, I'm into conspiring against conspiracy theories, census strict, you know, but you know, what to do? That's the point. I just wanted to, to, to show that the Institute is uh, already active. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Nebuisha, we are glad to, to, uh, that you are doing something. I want to get a copy of that tabloid. Uh, I, I'm very interested, and I believe the people uh, from the, in, in your space there and people on Zoom are also uh, very interested in what, what's your product. Uh, so thank you very much, all of you. Of course, the big thanks to our uh, three um, talkers. Tokos tonight, uh, Bronwyn, Anna, and Milica. Uh, you were so patient, and uh, I think I was so pleased to, to be engaged in this um, uh, discussion. Although I could see myself in the window uh, beside, um, behind Milica, and now I'm watching myself on the Zoom. So if so, <laughs> it's very interesting. Like um, very interesting. My position is, is so complicated now, but I, I hope that I wasn't too. Um, but I, I hope that, that I managed to to let you speak of, of what was important for you. And I'm so sorry in this hybrid uh, setting, it's some kind challenging. But thank you for patience with me and with this format. And thank you for all your contributions. And of course. The debate is continuing. I believe Nebuisha will, will arrange something for us in the future. So thank you all. Yes, thank you, Nadja, so much for uh, accepting this role. Not that easy, not only in technical, but in conceptual and content-wise uh, 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 matter. I want to thank Bronwyn, also to Melissa, uh, once again, that they came to our technicians that did the heroic job in the last uh, uh, few days. We, I, I couldn't explain to them what, what, what was expected, you know, like, uh, and 
if it is uh, for some, uh, you know, to, like excuse, <laughs> I saw many hybrid events, not the one uh, resembled event. It was like confusion that you have to go through. Anyway, I think that we, maybe we manage uh, the people that were present can send us impressions, also questions. We will continue uh, with the uh, uh, following institute's work. We will uh, uh, issue this uh, some sort of results of the, uh, uh, the project. We will publish uh, 10 to 15 retold scientific papers and translate it which would be very interesting to see how complex is the topic and how active is academic, international academic scene. You know, they are going into every detail. This is where we borrowed our, our title from conspire. You, know, so you, you discover what it means, it's very, like to, to breathe together or to, to whisper in the closeness, you know, very nice words for, uh, for uh, understanding the meaning. Also, I would suggest to visit Artists for Democracy website because it's very instructive for us because what we have now to do we have to we have to redefine referendum you know like it's it's like redefining democracy and right to vote and uh, you know again in the united states uh, next to all these attempts to uh, reduce the capacity of people to even access this uh, system of democracy you know and the urge to work on that is common to us we must also, I mean, we, we even in, even if the system is set properly now here, open to everybody, the atmosphere and the hegemony of ruling party is something unseen so far. You know, like it's, it's, it's it appears as impossible. And this is not just because they are what they are and they are authoritative, uh, uh, monopolistic and, uh, you know, like, um, um, organization like uh, for uh, for total control of society uh, the point is that uh, this has also deeper uh, deeper re uh, reasons and uh, and uh, deeper preconditions to 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 get developed and this is what we could maybe work more as cultural workers and artists it's at least we have freedom at least to to point out to something still we have freedom of those you know like and uh, and maybe it is it is something that we could be engaged with mm -hmm. to to go into this like deeper foundations of the problem that everybody agrees is is at the moment huge and uh, hard to hard to face and hard to fight even more hard to fight mm -hmm. Brownvin, if you have something maybe anybody <sighs> Thank you. This has been a wonderful conversation. It's really, really great to meet all of you and to be here and to have an opportunity to engage in these issues. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, yeah, thank you. Thank you all. And bye. 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 See you.